Calvary Ministries couple, a non-denominational indigenous mission agency in Nigeria, presents Last Days Gathering. Last Days Gathering is a mission conference for all, whereby we learn how to finish the unfinished task of the gospel. Him, this Jesus, at Government Camp Gospel Village, Igbo Lunyuro, Ojo Imano. by missionaries. But I think the mistake many Christian schools make and many Christian parents make is to try to teach conformity. Conform. And as far as I could understand at that age, Christianity was just part of the school rules. And I can bet you I was essentially anti-establishment. I was a rebel. So if everybody was going left, I wanted to know what was on the right. So because Christianity was made part of the school rules, I rebelled against it. You could never be a prefect unless you were a Christian. You could never be a class captain unless you're a Christian. You could never be a head boy or head girl unless you're a Christian. And man, these guys were wicked and unreasonable. They were just unreasonable. So what was my conclusion? Christianity is a religion of wicked, unreasonable people. Where did I find that? From the Christian prefects, Christian class captains, Christian head boys, Christian head girls. And then they brought a youth copper into our school. I cannot forget his name. One, Mr. Mutala, who was a Muslim. And he came from Balausman School of Sociology in Zaria. And he began to cleverly indoctrinate us about socialism, communism, and Islam. He began to teach us that the whole of Western philosophy is to demean the African. He basically turned us into Pan-Africanists. And if you are a Pan-Africanist, the church, Christianity is not part of it. In fact, he told us something I'll never forget. That if you must follow a religion, Islam is the African religion. It doesn't demand that you wear Western clothes, and I didn't like Western clothes. It doesn't demand that you must marry only one wife. I mean, you can marry four wives. That's African. You don't need to denounce your culture to be a Muslim. And it made sense. Did it make sense? Yes. So cleverly, we're being tuned toward Islam. And he gave me a book. I can never forget Das Kapital, the Bible of Communism. And began to give us Mao Tse-sun's read books. And one of the first things we learned was religion is the opium of the people. And so for me, my introduction to Jesus was a long road. I honestly believed that the Bible was a lie. I wasn't pretending. I honestly believed that Jesus was like Okonko in Things Fall Apart. You take a character, you write a story around that character. That's brilliant literature. It doesn't have anything to do with God. So I was always looking for a reason to believe that Jesus was a lie. The Bible was not true. God was just man's idea to tame little children. To make it worse, my best friend in high school was a pastor's son. And he taught me all the bad things I knew. The disco dances, how to drink without getting drunk, how to chase a girl in five minutes and win. So I learned all that from my pastor's kid's friend. And I asked myself, if the pastor's kid does not believe in what his father is doing, there must be something in it he knows that I don't know. 
I cannot weep more than the bereaved. So I turned my back against the gospel. I turned my back against Jesus. In fact, at a point, when my principal began to force us to go to church, first I told him I was a Catholic. I won't go to a Protestant church. So they allowed us on Sundays to go to town. That was our excuse to go and misbehave. Of course, we got caught one day. Say no more going to town. So I said, okay, now I'm a Muslim. I'm not a Christian anymore. I got the Muslim boy in school to teach me all the sh shahada and all that should be done. So to avoid Christ, I turned to Islam. Not as if I believed in it. But you know, the Lord is very awesome. God is a master strategist. You can't beat him. Hallelujah. This pastor's kid got born again. And it was through him I got introduced to Jesus. His name, Barry. One day I looked at Barry. And as I looked at Barry, I saw a changed man. I saw a man who was so at peace with himself. Now, in all this journey, let me say this. Three things bothered me. One, what happens to people when they die? I couldn't find an answer to death. So I was always afraid to go to a funeral. But when the mother put this man in the ground, or this woman in the ground, I stand by and I say, so what happens? And if life all ends in this grave, there's no meaning to it. The second problem was, with all the things happening outside, I was restless on the inside. I had no peace. In fact, I wondered what life was all about. No meaning. Even the school I was attending, there was no meaning to it. I went to school as a matter of natural progression. If you finish primary school, where do you go to? If you finish secondary school, where do you go to? If you finish university, where do you go to? Job market. That, I had no vision for going to school. It was a matter of natural progression. In fact, I had no vision for my life. But then I saw Barry. After two years, he had finished before me, gone up to do A-levels. And I came into the school where he was doing A-levels. And I saw Barry, and one look at Barry told me a different story. I saw a changed man. He didn't talk to me. I walked up to Barry and said, hey, Barry, what happened to you? He said, I have become a Christian. How can you just be becoming a Christian? A pastor's son? Then he said, well, I'm born again. But what does that mean? He tried to explain to me. It never made sense. But I couldn't argue with a changed life. Friends, that was my first lesson in evangelism. The best tool for evangelism is a transformed life. Not a tract. Not a book. What? What? A transformed life. And I saw a transformed life. And he told me Jesus was the reason for his transformation. So he began to preach to me that day. To be honest, I was very impatient with anybody who preached to me. In fact, a two days earlier, a deeper light man caught me on the road as I was waiting for taxi to go to that school. As he began to preach to me, I slapped him and tore the track. But I caught myself listening to Barry. Why? I respected Barry. My second lesson in evangelism. If a person does not respect you, he will not respect your message. The third thing, after he has spoken to me passionately, even with tears, I asked Barry, why are you bothering about me? Why are you telling me all this? Barry told me, because I love you. 
I taught you the way to hell. I have found the way to heaven. I want to bring you along. My third lesson in evangelism. If it does not originate out of love, forget it. Too much of our evangelism is a membership drive for our fellowship or for our church. We are not concerned about the person we are talking to. We are like MTN vendors or insurance vendors. Just recruit. If love, Paul said, the love of Christ constrains me. And the world is never food. They know when you are talking to them out of love. They know when you are doing a professional job. So that night, that day, I was preparing for a party in town. And I was actually going to make an arrangement for the party when Barry arrested me. And there was this little girl I had chased for two years who never gave me attention. Now, I will tell you why I'm telling you this story. We are talking about Jesus, not me. But listen, follow me. So for two years, I chased this girl called Helen. And she kept insulting me that I was a bush boy. In fact, my mouth was smelling. Can't be my girlfriend. Two years later, I became more polished. So I started looking for Helen. And I asked, Helen was the younger sister to Barry's girlfriend. So I said, Barry, where is Helen? Barry tells me Helen was right in that school. Where will I see her? Oh, there's a meeting somewhere in the evening. If you come there, you'll see Helen. Immediately, my mind thought it was a party because I knew Helen as a party girl. Only to get there, it was a Christian meeting. My first disappointment. My second disappointment, the guy leading worship used to be our DJ in the club. And I'm like, when did Mike become a gospel singer? Then I sat down because I spotted Helen. Fast forward. I went into that meeting to find a girl. Jesus arrested me. Hallelujah. And I want to spare you the long story. But when I prayed that simple sinner's prayer, I prayed it as if I believed it. But it was going to be a test. People say if any man being Christ is a new creation. If Jesus comes into your life, he will change you. Barry told me he was transformed because of Christ. So for me, it was a greenhouse experiment. If I pray this prayer and nothing happens, me and God, we kiss ourselves goodbye. But honestly, something happened. Hallelujah. What happened? Two, three things. One, for the first time in my life, I felt a big weight and load off me because I asked Jesus into my heart. Barry backslid. This backslid completely. Became a drunkard. This same Barry that led me to find Christ. When I was preaching to my elder brother, I said, when did you become a Christian? I said, it was Barry. I said, Barry that is in my school, I traveled to Medjugorje from Joss to go and check that Barry was truly changed. Only to find him in a beer parlor. But it never changed my faith in Jesus. Hallelujah. Because there was a genuine encounter. There was a genuine experience. I could not deny. If you came out today and said the Bible is fake, it does not change my faith. If you came out today and said Jesus is fake, it must be a Chinese version of your Jesus. My Jesus is real. He changed my life. The reason I'm here today because of Jesus the reason I ever became a missionary is because of Jesus. I had no such ambition. So this Jesus, this Jesus is the main, the main issue. You miss him, you miss the essence of life, you miss the essence of faith, you miss the whole essence of this garden. May we not miss it in Jesus' name. So we are going to talk about this Jesus in various dimensions. You know, the story of Jesus cannot be told by one man. 
The whole Bible from Genesis to Revelation is the story of Jesus told by different people. Even the gospel, God never allowed one man to write the gospel. So you'll be hearing different versions of this Jesus, but it's the same Jesus. And he has not lost his power. You know, if my story tells you anything, that no This time here be a journey to know Jesus. You came to the to the camp. This morning may you come to the conference. There's a difference between coming to the camp and coming to the conference. You come to the camp, you see the town, the camp, the people, the dining hall, the, the amenities that are there or not there. You come to the conference, you come to Jesus, you come to the throne, to the altar. I want us to rise up and take a song as we go into this morning session. Open my eyes, Lord. I want choir people leader. Open my eyes, Lord. We want to see Jesus. To reach out and touch him. And say that we love him. We began our exhortation yesterday. Our uncle told us to shout, we love Jesus. Let's start that song. I'm sure we all know the song. Open our eyes, Lord. Open our eyes, Lord. We want to see Jesus. Let somebody start that song. us to sing that song two times as we go into the message this morning.
Father, unless you open our eyes, Jesus may pass us by. We may not know. Except you open our ears, he may be speaking, we will not hear. So Lord, we plead with you this morning. Give us eyes that we see Jesus. Give us ears that we hear Jesus. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Please be seated and God bless you. Let's turn our Bibles to the book of Matthew chapter 16. We've looked at the theme text, Acts 2, the Lord yesterday. So I want to read a slightly different scripture as we begin this discussion this morning. Matthew 16. But before we read, let me say that the greatest knowledge, the greatest strength, the greatest experience, the greatest wealth and possession you can ever have is to know Jesus. Hallelujah. When our brother Paul understood this in Philippians 3, he said, everything I had thought was gain, when I met Jesus, I realized it was a loss. And I can say that of myself and of my experience. If the Jesus you found has not replaced every ambition and every drive, you found not the original. The Bible says when you find him, is to find all things. If Jesus does not satisfy you, nothing else will. That's why I'm so scared about this next level Christianity. Because essentially what that next level Christianity says is that you are a nobody. Until you rise in your job and become the CEO. Until you change your car from a Kia Picanto to a Mercedes SUV. Until you move house from Mokola to Bodija. Until your husband has an American citizenship. If none of those has not happened, you are at a lower level. What a lie. The Bible says, in Christ, God raised us to the highest level. We are seated in the heavenly places. Where? At the right hand of God. Above all principalities and power. In Christ Jesus, I am above Donald Trump. In Christ Jesus, I'm above Muhammad Buhari. So I don't envy his position. Hallelujah. So the knowledge of Jesus and the pursuit of that knowledge become the biggest pursuit you can ever embark on. With all that Paul knew, he said, look, I have not yet attained. But this one thing I do, forgetting what is behind, what do I do? I press on. It's a continual education, lifelong education, lifelong learning. So as we look at this Jesus, may we not be academic about him, may we be experiential. The analysis of Jesus is not the issue. The revelation and experience of him is the matter. There are professors of Christology in UI who can expound Jesus. You can get a PhD from that exposition. 
but it does not translate to an experience. And as long as it does not translate to an experience, it's a vain pursuit that I may know him. Hallelujah! And the fellowship of his suffering and the power of his resurrection, that was the goal of Paul's pursuit. It was not to get a master's degree. So as we look at Jesus in the various shape he's bringing, it began last night, and you may find out that if it's Jesus we are talking about, there will be repetitions. In fact, it may almost bore you because you cannot be talking about two Jesuses. But in all that, may we catch the various dimensions that then help us. Matthew 16. From verse 13. Now, when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, Who do people say the Son of Man is? You see, it was so important to Jesus. That men have a correct understanding and revelation of him. Because, one, you can never experience Jesus beyond your revelation of him, your personal revelation. Number two, you can never worship him beyond your personal understanding. Number three, you can never preach him beyond your personal experience. So whether it's to worship him, to experience him, or to preach him, that knowledge is essential. So it was important to Jesus to pause and to ask that question and to find out. It was a peer review strategy. Hallelujah. Who? And they say, some say John the Baptist. Others say Elijah. Others, Jeremiah. Or one of the prophets. Hallelujah. Oh my Jesus. May we never rely on other people's understanding of Jesus. If the disciple had relied on other people's understanding of Jesus, they would have had a wrong Jesus. Who do men say? Who does your bishop say Jesus is? Who does your disciple say Jesus is? Who does your pastor say Jesus is? Who does your favorite prophet and man of God say Jesus is? They are entitled to the opinion of Jesus. May you gain your own understanding. Because people review Jesus according to their need and experience. If you look at the answers they gave, some say John the Baptist. Those are the people that were led them by sin and needed baptism. So as far as they were concerned, who was Jesus? They baptized them. All that concern was that they would go to the wilderness they will repent of their sins. They will be baptized. That was their exposure of Jesus. Until today, as far as many people are concerned, Jesus is just a man who saves you from sin and makes you a new person. They were not wrong. Jesus baptizes. Hallelujah. But he's not John. So his baptism is different. But John later said, I am only baptizing with water. He is baptizing with something more serious. Hallelujah. So don't swallow a man's revelation of Jesus hood, line, and sinker. You need to gain your own. Others say, Elijah, that is the people that are charismatic. They like power. Hallelujah. Elijah was the prophet of power. Each time the Bible speaks of Elijah, it speaks of the power of Elijah. 
Oh, hallelujah. His prayer life, that fire comes down. And for those who love miracles and power, Jesus is just a power worker, miracle worker. If Jesus does not work miracle, they don't relate to him. If there's no show of power and demonstration of it, there's no interest. And so they push just that angle of Jesus. And if you only know Jesus as a miracle worker, you are half-sized. Does he not work miracles? He does. I know a Jesus with whom nothing is impossible. That's why I tell our missionaries, when we say we live by faith, I don't know how big your faith is. A missionary was talking to me last week. I asked him, how can I be praying for you? Well, tell him, they said, look, I need to do this. God is telling me to do this. God is not doing it, but we need money. And I say to him, I have a problem with that. Because the people you want to reach are hardcore Muslims. The faith that makes you believe that a Muslim can become a Christian can fetch you one billion dollars. Which is easier, that a Muslim got saved or God gave you one billion dollars? Which is easier? In fact, Jesus asked them, which is easier? To say, rise up and walk, or that your sins are forgiven. Which is easier? I believe in a Jesus. If the world economy runs aground, he can raise a new currency and new money. So I have no problem with the miracle side of Jesus. But that's not all that is to this Jesus. And may I suggest... That's not the most important thing about this Jesus. Others say, Jeremiah, one of the prophets, some people love the word of God. Ah, they love good teaching. They love the prophetic. They love the Bible teaching. Line upon line, precept upon precept, the deep revelation that comes from under the sea in the word of God. We love that. We can run everywhere to receive revelation. To them, Jesus was one revelator, Jeremiah, the prophet, who revealed deep things, the wheels, the Ezekiel vision, the wheels and the lion head and the ass head, the implication of all that. How many of us love such deep, deep, exciting teaching? We run around for that, even when they are not changing your life. You just went and got a deep revelation on the mystery of marriage. And for the last one where you have been quarreling with your wife. So what is the use of that knowledge? You just got a deep teaching on how to deal with the flesh. And for the last six months you are masturbating. So what is the meaning of that? Yes, yeah, Jesus is a teacher. He is the truth. He is the word of revelation. But there is more to Jesus than knowledge and revelation. Hallelujah. He says, or one of the prophets, verse 15, he said to them, but who do you say that I am? You. My prayer is that you will leave this conference not with what Professor Debumi say Jesus is. Not with what Brother Andrew or Dondo or anybody say Jesus is. You will leave this conference with a personal revelation of who you Say Jesus is. Hallelujah. That is a revelation that will keep you. That is a revelation that will help you. That is a revelation that will empower you. And so listen. He said, Simon Peter replied, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Hallelujah. And Jesus said, wow. There are a few times in the Bible that Jesus said, wow. This was one of them. If he was to exclaim today on WhatsApp, wow. He would turn up. Because he said, blessed are you, Simon Peter. Wow, Simon Peter. Great. 
And he said to him, Flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter. On this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail. I will give you the keys of the kingdom. Whatever you bind on earth shall be bound. Whatever you lose on earth shall be loose. Hallelujah. Then he strictly charged the disciple to tell no one that he was a Christ. What kind of thing is that? What is the correct revelation of Jesus? You are Christ. The son of the living God. If your revelation of Jesus does not build on that, it's a wasted revelation. He didn't say you are Jesus, the Son of God. Listen to me. The Bible knows English. So anytime you are reading the Bible, watch the English. Even if it's Yoruba, watch the grammar. If it's Hausa, watch the grammar. The Bible didn't say you are Jesus, Son of the living God. Because there are many Jesus. One of them plays for Manchester City. There are many Jesuses in Brazil. There are many Jesuses everywhere. If you open the Spanish telephone book, on one page you can see 20 Jesuses. And that's where many of us get confused. The Bible didn't say in the last day, many can come and say, I'm Jesus. So we're only talking about Jesus or so Yingbo. In fact, one Jesus just surfaced in Kenya last month. And the Kenyan government expelled him. The Bible never said in the last day many Jesuses were arrived. Many Christs were arrived. It's a difference. Jesus is a name. Christ is an office. What the Bible is saying is that you are Christ. You are Messiah. You are Savior. You are Redeemer. You are the sin eater and dead conqueror. You are Christ. The Son of the living God. So in our days, the devil is not in the business of throwing up many Jesus. In fact, if I change my name to Jesus Sankutu, God is not angry. It's just a name. If I woke up today and say I'm Andrew Lico, no worry. But if I go and present myself as the zonal director of Capro in Southwest, it is called impersonation. And that's where the problem comes. So in the last days, people will be impersonating Jesus. They will be taking on themselves the role and office of Jesus. So when you hear men of God saying, Come to my church. All your problems stop there. They have just declared themselves Christ. Look, all these running around. One prayer with me in my office will solve it. They have just declared themselves Christ. And that's where the problem comes. He is Christ. Can I tell you, Muslims, religious people don't have problem with the name Jesus. There is even a whole group in Nigeria called Isawas, followers of Jesus. Have you not heard about them? The problem they have is when you say he is Christ. So if you don't know him as the Christ, it's not a correct revelation. Anybody can baptize. Even John can baptize. Anybody can do miracles. Even the devil can do miracles. In fact, a pastor friend of mine that I knew when I was in the East, one of the pastors we used to pray together for revival in the Igbo land. Years later, he came to Lagos and traced me to my capro office. And then we began to talk. And he asked me a question. He said, Brother Sam, have you gone to the synagogue? I said, which synagogue? Synagogue is for Jews only, not for me. Have I gone to TV Joshua? He said, why should I go there? He said, Brother Sam, God is moving in that place. I said, which of the gods? Because the last time I checked, it was supposed to be a man in the synagogue, not a god. 
He said, God is doing miracles. I said, but the miracles are not an evidence of God's presence. The devil can do miracles. Listen to what this man of God says. He's a bishop. He said, Brother Sam, any demon that would, any devil that would do the miracles happening in the synagogue is a good devil. <laughs> to anybody, and the Bible says in these last days, the devil will anoint people to do such miracles that even the elect will be confused. Anybody can do miracle, but not everybody is Christ. Anybody can teach the Bible soundly. Anybody can bring deep revelations. In fact, when you read the story of the courts, most court leaders began by teaching what looked like great truths that nobody had told before, so people don't follow them. But not everybody can teach the truth. But only Christ is the truth. Hallelujah. The son of the living God. That's why I have problem when I go to a meeting. And I even hear some Christian pray that prayer. Praise the Lord. Are you not answering me? Praise the Lord. Praise the living Jesus. Excuse me, is there a dead Jesus? The last time I checked, the one I serve is alive. He's a son of what? The living God. When Peter got to that point, brethren, Jesus said, wow. Because you cannot come to that point by natural understanding. You cannot come to that point even by Bible study. Except the Spirit take the truth you are studying and exposes it to you. You can only know Jesus by revelation. Hallelujah. If you forget everything I'm saying, say the Jesus we are talking about can only be known by revelation, not by education. And so we want to begin from there. And I'm going to deal with four issues in my own session. I have two sessions. I'll deal with four issues. Now, before I pass, when Peter got that revelation, look at what Jesus said. Upon that revelation, I will build my church. And I will give you power and authority. Listen to me. You cannot be part of building God's kingdom if you don't have that revelation. You'll be a misfit. Two, you cannot exercise real spiritual authority unless you have that revelation. Friends, the greatest spiritual warfare you can fight it's not with demons and witches and ancestral spirits. Those ones were defeated by the real Jesus 2,019 years ago. He made a public show of them. And he gave her keys. Can I tell you what the real spiritual battle is? The real spiritual battle is when the enemy sells you a Jesus that is a Chinese version. That is not the correct Jesus. When the word of God is not the basis for your life and understanding. When God says stand up and every wisdom in the world is telling you the right thing to do is sit down. That is the biggest spiritual battle. Because when you stand on God's correct revelation of his word, the winds will blow, the rain will fall, the storm will come, you will stand. The day that know their God shall be what? Strong. So the battle we face in our generation is not a battle of witches and wizards. It's a battle of the wrong Jesus. People are preaching another Jesus. Another gospel. That only portray Jesus as a baptizer. Portrays him only as a miracle wonder. 
portrays him just as a good teacher of the world. He is more than that. He is Christ, the son of the living God. Anybody ask me who you are? You are the son of God. You are the son of God. That's the correct understanding. But look at what shocked me. Jesus now say, don't tell anybody that I'm Christ. I'm going to speak about four things. I want to talk about his background, this Jesus. I will talk about his person. I will talk a bit about his power and his purpose. In the two sessions that I have, this morning I want to talk about his background and his person. When we are talking about the background, what the prophets said about him, what preceded his emergence, where did he come from? Friends, background checks are so important. Before Buhari appointed his ministers, the security agencies went to do all the background checks. In fact, today, when you apply to enter a university, most universities without your knowing do background checks. When you apply for an American, British, European visa, even South African, they do background checks. Because America now insists when you apply for a visa, you must submit all your social media handles, your Twitter account, your Facebook account, your email account. They will check whether you are part of a group they don't like. Background checks. The tragedy of Nigeria is that we don't bother about your background. Have you heard of a man, one young man called Obin Aokeke, Invictus? One young man that rose from nowhere, became so rich, in fact, Forbes magazine put him on their cover as one of the 100. I mean, 100, you know, most influential young African. Forbes magazine. He has become the poster boy of entrepreneurship. Universities take him to their homes to address students. Big companies take him around. Government in Rwanda, Kenya, move him around. He should speak on how to move African young men to entrepreneurship. But nobody has a question. Where did this guy suddenly get money? Until two weeks ago, when the FBI found out that he's the leader of Yahoo Boys. Ford Magazine had to tender apologies for featuring him. Government are tendering apologies to their young men for raising a wrong role model. Companies are apologizing. Why? Nobody bothered about background check. You must have read another young man in Taraba State. Why do me? Huh? A fish seller who could not afford two baskets of fish by Benue River suddenly became a big philanthropist, buying houses, building house cars for people, buying houses until they found out he was the leader of a kidnap syndicate. On the put military officer, police people on his payroll, even sponsored people in the last elections. The governor of his state is fighting a publicity crisis because it was alleged he donated $150 million to the governor's campaign team and the governor accepted. America released a list of 18 Nigerians on FBI list. Now, I know two of some of those young people. One, Ori, you go to Port Harcourt, he's a king. One of them, the Imo governor, put him on his transition committee. One of them, a minister, he says his boyhood friend. Young men that suddenly rose up with wet that nobody questioned, nobody did background check. So for us to authenticate Jesus, may we do a few background checks in Jesus' name.
And if he will not fit the bill of who God said will be Messiah, don't go for him. God doesn't do a thing without first speaking it forth. So for Jesus, from Genesis, right from Genesis, God began to talk about this son of a woman that will crush the head of a serpent. Genesis 3.15. You know, the Old Testament is full of imageries of what will be real in the new. When you read Noah's Ark, just think of the church as God rescued him. The Ark of Noah represents the church of God in a dying world, where God is rescuing a remnant that he will repopulate the earth with righteousness. Praise the Lord. Hebrews 2.10 talk about God bringing many sons to glory by making the head of their salvation go through suffering. So there are hundreds of prophecies about Jesus on the cross, suffering, dying. Time will fail me to review all of them, but they are there. John in John chapter 1 talk about, I am baptizing with water, one is coming, of whose shoe I am not able to untie. He will baptize with the Holy Ghost. That day spoke about the stone that will arise and crush every kingdom that is against God. Hallelujah. We see all that in the background of Jesus. So when Jesus came, remember at his birth, when he was announced to the shepherds, they quickly went to try and find him. In the process, they passed through the city and started asking the wise men, the archaeologists, and the historians of, of the city. And they say, where is he that is to be born king of the Jews? News got to the king. He said, go and search diligently when you find it. Because they knew there was a history, there was a prophecy. So Jesus did not just come from nowhere. When John the Baptist came, they thought he was Jesus. They were confused. Are you the Christ? Tell us. Do you remember the story? Those who were historians and knew that something was going to happen, they sent men, go and ask John, who are you? Are you the Messiah? Even the woman of Samaria knew, said, we know that a Messiah is to come. There was a history there was a prophecy. Everybody knew that something was going to come. Someone was going to come. That is his background. He was a product of prophecy. And everybody knew. So Jesus had a precedence. Jesus was Jesus of history. Jesus well, Jesus that was being foretold before he came. And people knew. Remember the woman, Anna, in the temple? So, oh, my eyes have seen the salvation. I cannot depart in peace. People were expecting somebody. He didn't just jump from nowhere. He was a product of prophecy. He had a pedigree and a background. That is why many of us have issues. With men of God who just jump from nowhere and are big men of God. You can't tell where they sat on their Bible study and then you can't tell where they sat on their Sunday school. And that's why when people ask me all around the world, what do you think of T.P. Joshua? I say, I need to find his Sunday school teacher. Who led him to Christ? Who followed him up? You cannot find such a person anywhere. People with such backgrounds are dangerous. But we check. Hallelujah. In these days, the young man just rise up. I am reverend. I am reverend doctor and bishop. Where do they come from? What is the background? If you don't care to check, you'll be led astray. Hallelujah. Jesus had a background. If you want to understand his person, his power, his purpose, Check his background. What did the prophecy say about him? What was he supposed to come and do? 
There were clear prophecies. When the angel came to Mary, he clearly announced what this Christ will be doing. May the Lord help us to understand this Christ in Jesus' name. I want to dwell a little bit on his person, and then we will pray this morning. I talk a bit about his background. That if you want to understand a person, understand the background, understand where he's coming from. Don't accept any person who doesn't have a pedigree or a background for anything. That's why when you go to apply for a job, the first thing they ask you to submit is your CV. Is that not correct? Is that not so? And if you don't know how you structure your CV, it will determine whether you get that job or not. That CV is supposed to reveal to your potential employee where you are coming from, what experiences, what exposures. So this Jesus, his person, who do men say that I am? Who do men say that I am? What is your understanding of me? Who am I? Identity is very key to effective living. When you don't know your identity or don't know the identity of the person you are dealing with, it can be disastrous. Over the last week, I've been talking to a friend, a lovely brother that I knew, who wants to divorce his wife? And we are begging God and begging him. I didn't know the woman I married. I didn't know he was a witch. And I say to him, the husband of a witch is a wizard. How can you say you didn't know the person you married? I know that you were in coaching for three years. But we can hide under identity to do many things, either false or true. May the Lord help us to know the people we are dealing with. One very wealthy American died recently, committed suicide in prison. His name is Epstein. One of the leading entrepreneurs from New York, Epstein. Some of you have read about him. One of his best friends was B. Clinton. One of his best friends, Donald Trump. One of his best friends was Prince Andrew. And they spent a lot of time together. When that man died and been accused of being a sex predator, what did Prince Andrew say? I never knew him. I never knew he was that kind of person. May God help you to know the identity of your friends. Even the identity of the, say, the people you are following are men of God and women of God. Know them. A good shepherd knows his sheep and is also what? Known of his sheep. A man of God that doesn't allow you to know him, run away from him. Hallelujah. So when he asks you questions, how many times have you prayed? Sir, you, how many times have you prayed? Let me quickly get to a point where we will pray. Who is Jesus? Who is this Jesus? Isaiah 9. The favorite scripture on Christmas from verse 6 reveals the personality of Jesus. Unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given. Who is this son? The son of the living God. The government shall be upon his shoulders. His name shall be called what? What shall his name be called? Wonderful, Counselor, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. All those defining his person. Because if we cannot define your person, we cannot define your ministry. Ministry is simply an outflow of who you are, your life, your person. So for Jesus, Isaiah began to tell us who his person will be. Wonderful. Counselor. Comforter. Everlasting Father. 
Prince of Peace. You know those names. So if I needed counsel, any serious counsel, who should be my first counselor? But you know, we go every other place first. When we run into a roadblock, then we come to Jesus. And we put a poster on the wall. When all yes face, pray. May God tear that poster on your wall in Jesus' name. If, if you don't pray, all else will fail. Prayer is not a last resort. It's a first resort. When you needed comfort, who did you go to first? A man. When the man has discomforted you, then you run to Jesus as a last resort. May Jesus be your first comforter. That's his person. Prince of peace. When you need peace, when you needed peace, where did you run to? But remember the Bible calls him what? Prince of... What does the Bible call him? A prince is not yet a king. I hope you know. A prince is a potential king. So until you enthrone him king of your life, you won't enjoy that peace. That's why they will say, of the increase of his government and peace. In other words, as you bring an area of your life under his dominion, that area will enjoy peace. If you bring only the head, only the head will enjoy peace. If you bring only the hands, only the hands will enjoy peace. What you leave outside Jesus' dominion will never enjoy peace. Young men and women, may you bring your sexuality under Jesus. Your ambitions. Don't let your sexuality run riot. Bring your ambition. One of the biggest good things that is turning to be bad happening in the universities today is this course called entrepreneurship. What is it called? So every young man on graduate with a business plan, even when you are not a businessman, It's not everything you do that makes you a businessman. There are skill sets of a businessman that you need to have beyond the knowledge. But I meet many young men now. As they are just doing YC, they are business by the side. Before, as we are doing YC, we are preaching by the side. Is that not so? Now many youth copa, what are they pursuing? Business. Nothing bad with that. But it only shows that the world is squeezing us into their mold. Make money. Succeed. May God help Jesus bring your ambition under Jesus' control. Let him breed you your ambition. Because the Bible says, if you want to make money quick, what will happen to your soul? If you want to get rich quick, what happens to your soul? You destroy it. So I'm not against entrepreneurship. God, if you know me, I became an entrepreneur from the age of 12. By the time I was 15, I was financially independent from my parents. So I have nothing against that, but watch it. In John 1, he said, in the beginning was the Word. So who is Jesus? The Word. The Word was with God. The Word was what? God. So Jesus is God. Hallelujah. He is not just the son of God. He is what? God. Everything created was created by him. Apart from him, there's nothing created that was not created. Nothing created that was not created. And in him was life. The life was the light of the world. So he is life. He is light. He is God. That's what the Bible says he is. That's who he is. In Philippians 2, the Bible says God exalted him and gave him a name above how many names? At the sound of his name, what happens? But it depends on who is calling that name. <laughs> so don't just think, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, things will happen. That is an incantation. That is an incantation. 
There's a way you will throw up the name of Jesus and it will just be an abuse. For that name to work, there must be a solid stamp of approval on you by him. There must be a relationship. It is not a name you call out of fear. You are going on the road, the vehicle and that gallop. Jesus! You may still die. The Bible didn't say the call of fear shall deliver you. It's the call of faith. He is a name above all names. I was flying from South Africa to Lagos one time. As we are about to land, the plane ran into a storm. I've never run into that kind of storm in my life. I wasn't sure we would survive with all the faith. Brethren, over 100 Nigerians in that plane. You can hear all manner of prayer. Oh Lord God of Adeboye. Oh Lord God of Odukoya. Oh Lord God of Oyedepo. I knew the name of everybody's pastor from that prayer. But nobody... Very few call the name of Jesus. The name of Adegwe will not save you. The name of Oyedepo will not save you. For God has not given those names to save. It is only one name given under heaven by which men shall be saved. What is that name? Jesus. So why do you insult Jesus by replacing him with the name of men? John 4, we see that this revelation of his person is progressive. If you see John 4, the woman by the world knew him as first in verse 5 of John 4. How come you a Jew? That was one level. Verse 11, sir. He saw him as a lord to respect. Not a supreme lord, a human lord. Because sir was a title you are tied to respected men in society. That's why in England today, when you are knighted by the king, you become sir. Or if you are knighted by the Methodist or our church, you are knighted or semurumba, they don't call you sir. Sir was a title you are tied to respected people in the society. So as far as that woman was concerned, he was just one of the respected people in society. Verse 19, are you a prophet? You can see a gradual increase in understanding of who Jesus was. Finally, verse 25 says, We are told the Messiah will come. Jesus said, He that I'm talking to, I am he. At that point, she found the answer. Hallelujah. She now knew him as the Christ. Who is this Jesus? Hallelujah. Who is this Jesus? The Bible tells us that he is the bread of life. Amen? He is the living water. He is the gospel. He is the good news. 1 Corinthians 15. Your church cannot be good news. So stop preaching it. Your daddy in the Lord cannot be good news. Because every human hero has feet of clay. If you check, there are weaknesses in the life of that man of God and woman of God. A friend of mine who attends a very respected church the younger sister came from America, got a good job in Nigeria with UN. His concern was that the sister was not going to church. And I said to him, that shouldn't be your concern. Church is a meeting of God's family. Let her become a member of God's family first. But he kept pushing the girl, come to church. They had a special convention. Ah, come and hear my daddy in the Lord. Come and hear my daddy in the Lord. And the sister went. I know they always introduce newcomers. And this daddy in the law was smart enough to notice that there was one special newcomer. 
And that's how he began to pick interest in this newcomer until he eventually uh, tried to sexually harass this newcomer. And by the time I made this girl, don't even talk about church. Your man of God may not be good news. But Jesus is always what? Good news. That's why Paul said, I once again, you know, tell you the gospel. Jesus. He is a good news. Every other news is bad news. And that's why I say, if you are an apostle of good news, why are you spreading terrible bad news on your WhatsApp? Let's talk about Jesus. Friends, let me summarize what I'm saying. The most important revelation is the revelation of the person of Jesus. The most important pursuit is the pursuit of the knowledge of Jesus. The most critical experience is your experience of the person of Jesus. And this Jesus cannot be known by human effort. He is known by revelation. So when the Holy Spirit is come, he will reveal him. Shall we rise up?